Hello everyone, my name is Wesley Livese from the History of the Second World War podcast. My podcast is a mostly chronological retelling of the Second World War, and I hope you will join me on a journey through the most cataclysmic conflict in human history, as we try to answer the questions of not just what and where, but how and why. Join me on a journey not just through the famous campaigns, battles, and events, but also on a trip around the globe as we broaden the scope of Second World War history beyond the well-known battlefields of Europe and the Pacific. During weekly episodes, I seek to provide new insight for longtime students of the war, while also being a great jumping-on point for anyone seeking a deeper understanding of the Second World War. This podcast has made it to the invasion of Poland in 1939, and start listening now to find out how the world would find itself embroiled in its second worldwide conflict in just 20 years. You can find History of the Second World War on all major podcast platforms, or at History of the Second World War. Gamarjova, and welcome to the History of Sacarvelo, Georgia. I'm your host, Roberto, and this is episode 30, The Death of Iberia. If you thought the chronicles were especially historically unreliable concerning the life of Vaktang last episode, buckle up, because in this episode, instead of bad sources about the fall of the Kingdom of Iberia, we get almost none at all this time. Juan Cher, Juan Cheriani must be quite sad at the turn of events. I would also like to thank all the new patrons that have joined up in the meantime since our small hiatus. We thank you for your support here at the History of Sacarvelo, Georgia, and want to give thanks to quite a few new patrons. First, we must give major thanks to our new Spaspeto, Hal the Legionnaire, the borrowed general from Byzantium. Then to our Aristavi, Emily, Quinn, and Adam, and finally, many thanks to Aras Nauri, Mandy, who did the artwork for our two-year anniversary special. Thank you all for your support. We really appreciate it, especially in this time where things are a bit slower than usual. I want to preface this episode by saying that I'm going to try to make it as narrative as possible, but this is also the episode that ends season two of the podcast. There's not much information to begin with, so it may feel at times that I'm reading down a list, but it's all the information that we have for a roughly 60-year time period. Thanks in advance for understanding. The death of King Vaktan Gorgasali came as a major shock to the Kartveli nation. The man who had led the country through wars and times of great prosperity had met his end in battle. While the Persians showed no sign of slowing down their wars of aggressive expansion into Byzantine and Kartveli territory. The king was succeeded by his eldest son, Dachi, born to him by his Persian wife, Balandukt. Dachi was well versed in the ways of ruling, having been his father's aide for years, especially while Gorgasali had been fighting off in Sindhya. But without his father's guidance, his true test of leadership was upon him. Dachi spent most of his time at his palace in Ujarma, leading him to be called Dachi Ujarmeti, a great moniker for a homebody meaning Dachi of Ujarma. His half-brothers, Leon and Mirdat, who were the sons of Gorgasali's second wife, the Princess Helena of Byzantium, who received vast tracts of lands in the west of Kartli as part of their inheritance. Although they came to be regarded as the head Aristavi of Kartli, just, you know, sub lower than the king, they still paid tribute to their elder brother and recognized him as the rightful king of Kartli. With the ever thorny issue of inheritances settled, Dachi began the task of rebuilding after the devastation of the Persian invasion. The only lands left untouched by the fighting were the territories of Kakieti, Klarjeti, and Igrisi. The king dispatched masons across the land while he threw himself into the personal project of completing his father's great city, Tbilisi. Once fortifications were completed, the political capital was officially moved there, although the homebody king remained in Ujarma. It was at this point that the Catholicos Peter passed away and was replaced by Bishop Samuel. Loyal listeners may recall that these two appeared as friends and aides to Vaktan Gorgasali. 
Dachi took this opportunity to escape clerical meddling by moving their center of control to Metaschieta, away from both Tbilisi and Dujarma. Oh, and before we forget, the Byzantines and Sassanids were still at war. All the sources we know of say that a certain King Gurgen assisted and revolted against the Sassanids. If you're curious, that bit of information came from Procopius's wars and communications from Emperor Justin I of Byzantium that promised he would return the favor if King Gurgen assisted him. We're going to look a bit more into this in Season 3 as we prep for the lead-up to the Lazic War. And with that, our sources about the life of King Dachi are exhausted. The king of the Kart Valley died in 534, concluding a 12-year reign. His son, Bakur II, succeeded him and ruled from 534 to 547. Interestingly, our sources state that by 540, there was an Iranian viceroy living in Tbilisi. Most of the government was run by the local nobility and the church, whereas Bakur's power truly lay mostly in Ujarma and the surrounding lands of Kakieti. So, in other words, the Persians were truly in charge. You hear that? So you think you can rule Persia? You guys got it. After a 13-year reign, he was then succeeded by Parsman V. Parsman's reign was peaceful, but with each succession, it became increasingly apparent that the power of the Kartveli kings was on the decline. As the Lazic War raged on, Persians gained more and more territory and plundered more and more of their newly conquered lands. In spite of his weak position, Parsman V politely requested that Shah Khosrov I, maybe, you know, just thinking out loud here, please stop attacking Kartveli churches. He didn't even mention the land, just a church. Khosrov I agreed to Parsman's demands in exchange for his fealty to the Sasanian throne. Parsman accepted, much to the chagrin of his cousins in western Kartli, who used this as a chance to cut ties with Hujarma and side with Byzantium. The Kartveli kingdom had officially split in half, and all Roman history fans know what a strategically sound move this inevitably is. Dachi, Vakhtang's Persian son, and his descendants had allied with the Persians, while Mirdat, who was Vakhtang's Greek son, and all his descendants had remained with Byzantium as Vakhtang would have preferred. Parsman V died childless, ruling from 547 to 561, and the Aristavi placed his nephew, Parsman VI, on the throne. Kartli's power declined even more with this transition, as the direct line of descendants had been broken. Parsman was not raised expecting to be king, and was instead raised to be a devout man. He transferred that piety over to how he ran the kingdom, using his money to increase the splendor of all the churches in the land. However, he did do one thing to add to the Kartveli power. He revoked the right of Byzantium to appoint the Catholicos in Kartli, and instead placed a Kartveli noble named Saba as a new Catholicos. This is the only thing he is noted as doing, as sources do not even mention when he died. His son, Bakur III, took over the throne. Bakur III was just as devout as his father, and used what little power he had to build even more churches in the land. At some point during Bakur's reign, sources speak of a rebellion in western Kartli, led by Guaram of Klarjeti Javakieti, the grandson of Vakhtang and Helena. His allies included an Armenian prince, and he was supported by the Byzantines, hoping that they would manage to throw off the Persian yoke. This rebellion was put down, but this is not the last that history will hear of Guaram. And with that, Bakur III passed away in 580, leaving behind two small children who were too young to rule. These young children fled to the mountain passes with their retainers and their families. Before the Aristavi could come together to choose a new king, Shah Hormiz IV ordered them to appear before him in his court, and he gave them an offer the Aristavi could not refuse. He promised them all the riches that they could want, along with the abolition of the Georgian tradition of appointing rulers to a region, instead turning those regions into hereditary fiefs under their control. This offer had the Aristavi chomping at the bit. This was exactly what they wanted, and Hormiz knew exactly what he was doing. In fact, this exact same strategy was used over 100 years earlier to win over the Armenian nobility, offering each of them more power individually, while technically div depriving them of what little collective they had. This time, the Kartveli Aristavi had done just the same. The kingdom of Kartli was no more. And just like that, the kingdom reconquered by Parnavaz I in 299 BC ended for the sake of money and land in 580 AD. 
the kingdom of Iberia is dead. Long live the principality. To connect with us, feel free to find us on social media under at History Georgia or on Facebook at The History of Sacatabello, Georgia. To help this podcast continue, please feel free to subscribe to our Patreon or donate via Coffee or PayPal. The link is in the episode description. If you would prefer donating something a bit more tangible, we also have an Amazon wish list for you to peruse. And the best way to help us is via review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your preferred podcast host, as it goes a long way with getting the word out about the show and helping us reach new people to learn about Georgia. Madlaba da Nakfamnis, and thank you for listening to The History of Sacredville, Georgia. See you next time.